the spacesuits, and they're basically working in a one gravity environment, and they'll you know, work on whatever tools they need to. As far as zero gravity, there's no zero gravity room at NASA. You can't push a button and everybody starts to float. But we do have, we have a bombing comet. We used to have the KC-135, we currently have a C-9. And what it does is it goes off over the Gulf of Mexico, flies parabolas, and you know, during your parabola, we start coming down, just like a roller coaster, everybody starts to float, but you're not strapped into anything. You know, and you can, you don't stick your, heart, your hands and your arms outside the, the car on the way down, but it's, um, you get about 20 seconds worth of a zero G environment to get used to it. But there's no such thing as a free lunch. You know, you, you get zero G, but then when you start doing your pull out, you get two G. So, you know, I weigh about close to 200 pounds, so when I'm working with pull outs, it means I weigh about 400 pounds. Um, so, you know, training wise, it's, you know, it, it's a unique experience, and I think it's only going to be topped by, you know, the unique experience of actually being able to experience it firsthand. Dr. Olivas, um, is there a committee that looks at individuals uh, uh, where they consider them to go up to the next mission, and then once they are selected, has there ever been um, a time when individuals have been pulled from actually doing the mission. Okay, let me, I'll answer the question this way. When astronauts are selected, they pick from a pool of people who have been keeping their applications current. And they start with, let's say, 5,000 applications. And of those 5,000 applications, that year that are submitted, the astronaut office will go through the entire list and find the list of what they consider to be highly qualified applicants. That list is typically on the order of, or I'm sorry, the qualified applicants, people who meet the minimum qualifications, will fall into a list of about two to 3,000 people. Of that two to 3,000 people, the astronaut office will call again to a list of about 100 to 120 that they consider to be highly qualified. Of those people, they will bring them in for interviews within NASA, where you'll spend 95% of your time doing uh, physical as well as um, mental type of evaluations. Uh, there is a face-to-face -face interview that you go through, so that by the time you reach the selection process where the astronaut office says, okay, we want this person, we want this person, we want this person, this person, you know, you're talking maybe 10 to, to 20 astronauts, 20, 10 to 20 people. The reason I start there is because you have selected a group of people who all fall within a particular category of, of professional accomplishment and capability so that when you get to the point of assigning a mission, everyone is trained pretty much to do everyone else's job. That doesn't mean it's your primary function, your primary responsibility for that particular mission. When the mission is selected, what they will do is they will take a look at the group of 100 or so astronauts that currently exist in the office and say, okay, who are my, my, my real strong spacewalkers? Even though I got a bunch of guys who can do spacewalk, I got a real complicated mission coming up, so I'll pick someone who I think is a you know, good spacewalker. And this person works well with this person, so they pull the team together. And there's one person, the, the chief of the astronaut office, who pulls that together based on his knowledge of each of the individuals within the office. Uh, there are a number of people in, in our office who have been up many times. And, you know, I'm one of these guys who I came in based on my timing. I came in in 1998, right after a selection of 46 astronauts in the class of 96. Well, their last rookie is flying on STS-116, which is going up in December. So the, the wait has been long only because the line has been long. Uh, as far as people who 